Okay, so I just got done recording this episode with Michael Kadire, and let me tell you, it's it is fantastic information. It's fantastic content. You, you're not going to be able to get this just from scrolling on Twitter. All right, this is gonna this is insights from somebody who played 15 years in the major leagues and who had a lot of success. He talks about everything from how he went about dealing with insecurities and anxiety to making adjustments from pitch to pitch and scouting reports. It's it's phenomenal. So if you enjoy it, make sure to subscribe, share it with somebody. Here we go, Michael Kadire. All right, Michael, we're now live on the podcast. I, I really appreciate you coming on today, man. No, my pleasure. I, uh, I've listened to, to quite a few of your shows and enjoy the perspective that you try and share. So I'm, I'm honored to be, be here. Thank you. So I, um, I was listening to somebody yesterday, and I, I wrote down what they were saying. I thought it would, it would um, be a good way to start off the show. And I, I'm curious to hear what you think about this. So the quote is, when the data and the anecdotes disagree – the anecdotes are usually right. It's not usually because the data is miscollected. It's usually because you're not measuring the right thing. And I feel like in hitting, there's a lot of anecdotes and there's a lot of data. And so mm -hmm. it makes me wonder, you know, are the anecdotes the right thing most of the time? And by the way, that quote was from Jeff Bezos. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a great quote. Um, you know, I think, so the data is, and I agree a hundred percent and I agree a hundred percent because if you're looking at baseball and you're looking at the different levels and, and just in life general, you've got different understandings as you go through your lives. Right. So like what I mean by that is you're not going to take the data of a 10 year old show this 10 year old, this, this data, and then have him be able to apply his anecdotes, his feelings to, to make the data better or or to make the data in the general in the, the general direction that we as a coach want him to take it into but you can take that data to a big leaguer and he can now take it through all the experiences and, and the anecdotes that he that he's had up through his 23 years of life and he's now able to take that data and apply it and probably make it work so i think what we as a as a baseball society is too many times we don't compartmentalize the ages and the, the learning capacity of some of these players. We just take it as this general pot and say, well, Barry Bonds did this. We need to do it to this, this kid. Or um, Christian Yelich's exit velo and launch angle is this. We need to tell our, our high school freshmen to, to do that. So – I don't, I don't think we individualize enough. I think we generalize too much. Mm, I like that. If that I also makes think sense. We, we, yeah, I know it does. I also think we don't take into consideration um, like how long it, it can take for it to click huh. for players. So, like I had a kid, yeah. a high school kid in here that I've worked with for years. And um, the other day he comes in, he goes, yeah, I remember you telling me, you know, we were talking about an approach and I was, you know, at the time, this was years ago, I was telling him, Hey, you know, let's think like, let's be on the timing for um, opposite field for fastball timing. And so that way, if he throws a breaking ball, you can just stay on that exact same path and you end up pulling that pitch. And this was yeah. years ago. And he came in the other day. He's like, yeah, I remember you telling me about that. I was like, I get it now. I was like, dude, that was three years ago. Like I was telling you about that. <laughs> right. like, and so I, it made me realize like, man, it, it's, it's one, we shouldn't be tough or quick to judge a lot of hitting coaches at the professional level, because there's a lot of things you don't always know going on behind closed doors. And then two, I think from a development standpoint, man, it just, it takes longer. You know, we all mm. want that quick fix. And especially as a coach, it's like, what's the drill? What's the drill? It's like, it's a lot deeper than just a, you know, quick fix no drill. Doubt. You know, there's a great uh, book. I, I'm a I'm a big fan of Robert Green, um, you know, 48 Laws of Power. And but his book Mastery is is hits on what you're just talking about right now and the different phases that it requires to become a master, so to speak. And and one of his phases is that developmental stage. And this is just one of five stages. And just that stage is like seven to ten years. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, to expect a a 10 year old who gets a lesson once a week for six weeks to think that you're going to make a huge difference from week one to week six. 
I mean, that's right. kind of unrealistic. <laughs> right. So, so you played 15 years in the big leagues and I, I know you're doing some coaching now. I know you're with, you know, the manager of the United States um, under 18 team this mm-hmm. past summer, which I think is awesome over and you guys competed. And I want to ask you, because this is something that, you know, when I, my first year when I was in professional baseball as a hitting coach, uh, after the fact, I was like, man, you know what? I, I need to be more organized. Like I wasn't as prepared mm-hmm. as I thought, but you don't know what you don't know. And so my mm-hmm. question to you is, you know, you played a long time, but now that you're you know doing some more coaching and you were a, a manager this past year, was there anything that, you know, in the moment you're like, man, I wasn't, I, I need to be more prepared for X, Y, and Z going forward. I'd never thought about mm-hmm. this because I've, you know, played my whole life i haven't spent a lot of time doing this was there anything sure. like that that you experienced um when you were managing yeah i mean no question I, I think what you just said is is hits it right on the head the more organized and and as a player i just wanted to be prepared if i was prepared i was ready and i could i could live with results i could lay my head on the on the bed at night and be fine if i felt prepared um and it took years and years and years of learning what I needed to do to be prepared. So I think, yes, there, there's, there's things that, that you look at as, as now that I'm in the, in the coaching realm, but in, until you go through it, until you experience it, you don't know what those things are. Um, communication for me was one of the things, you know, and, and pro ball time is the resource as, as you know i mean if i need to if i want a hitting coach to come with me into the cage for three hours there's going to be a hitting coach to come with me in the cage for three hours i mean it's just the way it is so i i took for granted the level of communication when i was a player because it was just available to me mm-hmm. and i think as a coach and especially as a coach of high school kids you realize that time is not a resource. You're, you're constantly trying to get more time with the players. So your communication needs to be more concise. It needs to be more targeted and deliberate. And I think that's one thing that I, I, I wish I would have known or, or somebody had told me to really collect my thoughts and get them in one specific spot and then deliver them. Mm, yeah, that you're hundred percent right. It makes when you were saying that, it makes me uh, think about a lot of college coaches too, where it's like the limited mm. time in the fall and yeah. from a development standpoint. So that's um that's interesting. What what about from like when you were playing? Like were you were you somebody who if I talked to you during your playing career, I'd be like, Oh, that guy's gonna be a coach someday. Like were were you like that on the field and talking to the game and things like that? Cause I think there's some players who it's like, man, he, I could see him being a coach someday. And then there's others. It's like, I couldn't see it, but he ends up becoming a coach. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think exactly what you just said. Um, I don't, I don't think players get enough credit for there. We're all coaches. Mm-hmm. We're all coaches of ourselves. I mean, at the big league level, there's not one player that needs a coach, not one. They, they have them. You need other sets of eyes. No question about that. But none of them need a coach. They were, they're all their own coaches. So I don't think players get enough credit for literally how much time they spend talking about the game of baseball. Um, I think, and, and this is not any a knock against fans or anything. We just don't have the access. But if there was a, a camera that could follow everybody, every player from the time they wake up in the morning to the time they go to sleep at night or tracking their, their brain wavelengths, I'd say 80% of the time they're thinking about baseball. They're thinking about the game. They're thinking about um, their game, what they need to do, who they're facing that night, both pitching and hitting. That's all big leaguers do is that's the only thing they think about. And um, so, yes, I, to a long way to answer your question. I, I, Definitely people talked about me being a coach and there's definitely people that you didn't think was going to be a coach that are coaches and great coaches, but it's because every single player has experienced coaching, whether it's themselves or somebody else. What's something that you learned from like, maybe just even a hitting standpoint, maybe like a tip or something from a teammate in your career, like that really, really you feel like helped you or just it made sense and, and helped you maybe that day or just for the rest of your career. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely uh, many, many things. Um, 
I guess the, the, the one, here's one thing I, I will say that, that has made a lasting impression is when I went to Colorado and I got to play with Tulo and Cargo, they and Todd Helton, none of them cared who we were facing that day. So there was never like, okay, oh man, we got Kershaw on the mound. We're going to have to, we're going to have to battle or man, we got CC on the mound today. We're going to have to, it, it's, that's going to be tough. They didn't care. Um, when I was with Minnesota, there it was more talked about who we were playing, and and I'm not, nobody was ever fear of who we were playing or who we were facing, but it was definitely in the back of guys' minds that we're facing somebody tough. Man, we got Verlander today. Good luck, you know. You, you hear those conversations. Mm -hmm. When I went to Colorado, I never had those conversations, and now when I talk to high school kids, I try and relay that because you know with twitter and and rankings and all this stuff oh, we're facing this dude's committed to the to this d1 school we're, we're not going to be able to hit him today it doesn't matter who you face they got to respect you just like you got to respect them and i think that was one thing that really hit home for me and and really made a lasting impact on the three years when i was in colorado so before you went to Colorado, were you somebody who was like, "Oh, you're facing Verlander today," and you're like, "Oh man, this is gonna be this is gonna be tough." Yeah, it's gonna be tough as opposed to just, "All right, I got to face Verlander. I'm gonna go hit Verlander." I mean, you know what I mean? It was just like another day at the office. To whereas, you know, if you're facing the team's number five, that's how you thought. But when you're facing Verlander's, man, I gotta I gotta work my I gotta do something different. Well, you don't have to do anything different. You just you're going up there and you got to hit the pitch that he throws. So what do you think about a lot of the, and I'm sure you're well aware of a lot of the, you know, game planning that goes into, uh, into place today in today's game across major league baseball. And there's, you know, so much data, data and analytics. It's honestly, it's, mm -hmm. it's overwhelming. Right. But is there something that, I mean, do you think that, and this is the reason why I'm asking is because what you just said, it seems like, man, it just, you just went from over analyzing a lot of stuff to just compete mode and compete mode was a lot better. But do yes. you think that with a lot of the stuff today that you would have wanted that back then or not as much? Like, what what are your thoughts on kind of just where the game is at today from a game planning standpoint um, on a day by day basis? Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's too different on a game planning basis. I, I think where the information, in my opinion, gets overloaded which where i would not want this information is understanding my hot zones understanding my go zones so to speak understanding that i hit 330 with a with a, a 680 slug on balls up, up in the zone and i hit a 380 slug on balls down and away so i need to now look to go on the ball up and look to take the ball down i think those types of things are not that's not because then I become passive on certain pitches and certain counts where I use my dad, where I use the data is I wanted to know, I, I call them the bookends. I wanted to know what pitchers, who I'm facing that night, what he liked to start guys off with. And then what he liked to strike guys out with the book. I call it the, the story in the middle. I'm able to figure it out as the at bat goes, but I need to know to build my, my general generic approach I needed to know if I could afford to be more selective early in the count because I wasn't really afraid that he was going to strike me out deep in the count or if I needed to get to this guy early because if I let it get deep in the count, I got no shot. Mm -hmm. So that's how I game planned against certain pitchers and, and understanding what they were trying to do and what I needed to do to counter it. Okay, this is, this is really good stuff. So why wouldn't you want to know – what you were really good at. Cause you hear that. I'll, I hear that a lot, even from, from coaches in pro ball and, you know, working with hitters and things like be great at what you're good at. And they'll talk about, Hey, you do damage in this part of the zone. Like, let's just look here. Why do you say, I don't want, I don't, that, that wouldn't have helped me. Well, because the whole job of a pitcher is to throw the pitch that looks like it's going to be what you do well. And then it disappears. You know, I mean, the whole job of a pitcher is to throw that pitch that's going to be a strike for 58 or 59 feet, and then it's a ball, and now you roll over to the shortstop. In my opinion, the variables are too great, and the margin for error is too small when I'm only looking in one particular spot. Um, and, and, if, and if I know I don't do well on pitches down and away, 
then I'm inevitably going to swing at that pitch down and away. And I'm, I'm now not going to be as aggressive to the pitch up. So I, that's just, and that's just the way my mind work. And again, that's why I say earlier. And when we were talking is that I think we're too general, you can't take my approach and say, and, and go to a, a player in a ball and say, well, this is what Michael Kadire did. This is what you should do. Right. And that's why I mean that the general approach to me is, it's it's really it's a dangerous slope you know to say hey guys know what you do well and and just do that well that didn't work for me that wouldn't work for my brain mm. how long did it take you to get to a point where you knew what worked well for you um i mean it took a it took a long well a, a long time i mean i knew that that um i wanted to do damage on mistakes that's it and when I say mistakes, a mistake can be a fastball as well. People think that every time we talk about, you know, you're a mistake hitter, that it's only a hanging slider or a hanging curveball or something. Well, mistakes is that if a guy's throwing 96, sometimes it's going to come out at 93. That's a mistake. And that's the one I needed to do damage on. I never wanted to train at guys' best pitches and best stuff because I'm not going to hit that anyway. The, okay. the reason that they're it's the best pitch that they have, they know they're going to throw it. I'm not going to hit that pitch. I don't care if if I know it's coming. If it's their best pitch, I got no shot. So I I always look for just mistakes. Mistakes to me, we're training the medians. Medians are mistakes. The spectrum, the end of the spectrum, I'm not going to hit those anyway. I'm not going to hit the ball that's way out of the zone, and I'm not going to hit the really tough pitch that's down and away at 89-mile-an-hour slider. I'm not hitting that either. Mm, okay. You you mentioned before that you wanted to know how the, the pitcher would you know start you off and then also finish too and then in between it was kind of like you know you knew what to do is what you kind of mm -hmm. said right can you can yeah. you walk everyone through like what that means because I, I feel like this is more like the art of hitting right here where it's like mm -hmm. you know what I mean and like I don't hear a lot of successful players not to their father own but like talk about you know really this game like approach and mid at bat yeah. and it's the like competing and things like that could you walk everybody through that sure well i love what you just said right there because i i think that's where we are as a baseball society as well um it's not a science hitting is not a science swinging is a science biomechanics is a science I can take somebody who's never swung a bat before and he studies biomechanics and I can tell you how to swing a bat, but hitting is an art. It's an, it's an artist. Pitching is an art. Throwing is a science. Pitching is an art. So to, to, to talk about that, if I, if I look at a guy's, I could look at a guy's stat line. And if I see that we'll call it, he's got 130 innings pitched. He's got, uh, a four, five, a four and a half ERA. He's got 180 strikeouts, we'll call it, 170 strikeouts, so a, a strikeout pitcher. And he's got 80 walks, so a lot of walks. I have to look early in the count to be aggressive. And as the count gets deeper, I'm starting to not – I'm just not going to swing anymore. Because number one, he's probably not throwing very many strikes deep in the count because there's, that's, a, that's why he's getting a lot of swing and misses. But it's also why he's walking a lot of guys because he's throwing those really tough sliders or really tough fastballs that guys can't hit, but they also – they're not in the zone either. So you're taken. So that's one way I would build an approach. I got to be aggressive, and if I get to two – if I after like pitch two or three off of a guy like that, I'm probably just going to go into take mode. And if he strikes me out looking, he strikes me out looking, but there's a really good chance I'm going to walk. And I've got to understand now, and that, and it's easier in pro ball. It's easier in pro ball because I'm getting 500 at bats. I can afford to be wrong in an at bat. High school, I, I get a hard time to be, you're not really affording to be wrong in high school when you're only getting 70 at bats in a year. You know what I mean? So, that's kind of how if, if I'm facing a guy with the same numbers, but his walks are like 20, right? I know that he's going to throw it. He's going to throw strikes deep in the count, but they're probably going to be really tough pitches. And he's probably going to throw those balls that look like balls that end up strikes. He's probably going to have a lot of looking strikeouts. And so there I need to be more aggressive in the count with one, two strikes on me or, or when I'm down. 
Okay. I hope I like, that makes a little bit of sense. No, that is, that's, <laughs> that, no, that, that's really, really good. I want to follow up though and ask you, it, you, you said something about, and you had said it because at the high school level, it's a little bit harder, but you said, Hey, if he strikes me out looking like he strikes me out, do you think more hitters would benefit from having that type of mindset? Not the mindset of like, it's okay to strike out, but the mindset of, like, you know, not expanding the zone in, in fear of striking out, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. At higher levels, yeah. At, 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 at higher levels, pro ball, um, division one, power five conferences where you're getting 250, 280 at-bats against that tough Friday night pitcher. Yeah, I, I definitely think you it would benefit. At high school, you're not facing those guys that are that nasty all the time. It might be nasty to you, but, I mean, it, they're not really in the grand scheme of things that nasty where you have to have this really in-depth approach. In high school, the, what I tell most kids in high school is look middle-middle and let it fly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, if you look middle-middle and we're not looking at particular parts of the zone, chances are those pitches that are AWOL, which is most of the balls of high school pitchers, you're going to take them anyway. You just can't miss the ones that are, that are middle, middle. Like we can't, we can't miss those. But the good thing about high school is you're probably going to get two or three of them in an at bat as opposed to two or three in an entire game at those higher levels. Were you looking middle, middle a lot of the time? Early in the counts. Yeah. If I was aggressive, if, if that bookend told me I needed to be aggressive and I needed to be, I needed to get this guy when those first two or three pitches. Yeah. I was looking middle, middle, because that allowed me now to, if I was going to expand, I'm expanding in the strike zone. Where if I'm looking in and I have to expand, the, the ball, I'm, my, my margin for error is so much smaller because the ball in, in is going to be a ball and I'm probably going to jam myself. And the ball, like middle, outer third, I'm probably going to take, which is a strike. Mm. So your, your yeah, perception in of the count, zone, yeah. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So when, and when I needed to be aggressive early, it was, it was middle, middle. And I sat speeds often. Um, I didn't sit pitches because I never wanted to sit shapes. I mm -hmm. wanted to sit speeds. So for instance, if you hear a guy say, all right, I sit slider, right? Sit slider right here. Well, I didn't want to sit slider because I didn't want to get fooled by the backup slider, the hanging slider. But I did want to sit slider speed. So my the way I sat into my hip, the way I was ready to, 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 to be aggressive to the ball was at about an 88-mile-an-hour clip as opposed to a 96-mile-an-hour clip, if that makes any sense again, too. And if, if I'm sitting, if I know a guy's got – if I'm facing Barry Zito and his curveball 79, I'm sitting – at about an 83 mile an hour, because now I've got a better chance of hitting. I don't know what he's throwing. So I got to give myself the be the biggest margin of error to be able to hit these pitches that I'm, I'm going to commit to. So I always set speeds as opposed to pitches. I mean, I, again, I don't know if I'm articulating it well enough. No, I, I, I um, so just to clarify. So, so for example, you, you gave the example of the slider and you said you wouldn't yeah. want to sit the shape of the slider because if he, hung a slider, then you wouldn't have seen it the same Correct. way. Then I wouldn't have. Exactly. Exactly. If he, if I'm looking slider and typically this guy throws the slider that starts on the outer third, ends up on the outer half. And he throws that backup slider that we all jump on and it starts on the inner half and ends up right down the middle. And we're at TV screaming. How did you not hit that? I wanted to be able to hit that pitch. And if I sat shape and I, and I, and especially if I knew what that guy's slider looks like, and he comes out of the hand as a hanger, typically you're going to get fooled and you're not going to hit it, mm. at least for me. So I wanted, that's why I wanted to sit the speed because if I'm sitting 87, the slider is 85 and it comes out and it's hanging, it's not going to surprise me and I'm going to be on time and I'm going to hopefully be able to do some damage on it. Do you think a lot of other guys had that same approach you played with, like that type of? Some. 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 And talking to them, yeah, some, some. You know, like like I, you talked to Tulo, and he was he would sit fastball ninety ninety five percent of the time, and and be able to react. I didn't feel like I was good enough to be able to sit fastball and react to other pitches, or sit slider, and and still be able to hit the slider that that was a backup slider, things like that. For me, 
it was all about sitting speeds. I needed to sit speeds. I felt like if I sat speeds and I was, I was going to be on time to anything in that general area of, of the speed. How often would you auto take a pitch? Like, let's say you feel the game like speeding up on you. Maybe you're not picking up mm -hmm. the ball very well. Like there's a lot of different things that could be going on. Would there be times when you would just, Hey, even if it's right down the middle, it doesn't matter. Like you're taking it yeah. less than two strikes. Would you ever do that? Less than two strikes? Not many less than two strikes. Um, no. More with two strikes. More with two I strikes. Auto, I auto took, I auto took, especially latter part of my career, I auto took three, two, probably 20% of the time, 25% of the time. And when I, it's funny because when I auto took, I don't have a bat in here. Um, I would, I would take my, my, my index finger and put it behind the handle. That way I could not swing because a lot of times we might tell ourselves to auto take. We might say, okay, I'm auto take, but it, damn it ball looks, it looks good. So they, you go after it anyway and you end up rolling over or you swing and miss. Cause you really, you weren't in the mindset to actually hit. So I would physically put my finger behind my handle. And if I swung, I would break my, break my finger. Wow. I've never, and I would do that. Say that. I would do that. Like I said, especially latter part of my career. And if I knew, and that's the other thing about pro balls, we know these guys, we know the pitchers, we faced them, we've got track records. We know if they're going to try and prey off of my aggressiveness or not. And uh, so, yeah, three, two, I did that often. Why in the latter part of your career? I started learning more. I started having more wisdom, learning that I, I start, you know, chasing balls. And I know that this dude's slider is nasty he's gonna throw it to me here three two it's gonna look like a strike for about 59 feet and it's going to be a ball but i didn't trust myself enough to know that i would take it so that's why i would i would do that yeah that's so cool did you just think of that on your own of putting your thumb behind so you couldn't swing yeah putting that index finger behind because index index i knew i wouldn't be able to swing yeah, yeah. wow that's interesting that's interesting what i want to talk a little bit about kind of your own development throughout your career i was listening to you and i i know i mentioned this to you before on uh when sheets did a podcast with you jeremy sheetinger who does a great mm -hmm. job by the way and uh you had mentioned a, a couple things that i actually when i heard that i recorded a video myself saying those things and i sent it out to some of the players that i hit with because mm -hmm. i thought it was so in, impactful um uh, and i'll tell you a quick story so i had a after that happened i had a kid in the other day and I was you know he was he's in his junior year he's getting recruited and you know he's nervous he's doubting himself from time from time to time and I told him the story about how you would stay up till 6 a.m in the morning and, and 2005 uh, right so you didn't have to go to the park and everything like that and I was like here's a guy who played 15 years in the major leagues like was an all-star and and he's doing this like so we I get it you're anxious but like just know you Guys at the highest level, same thing. And he goes, mm -hmm. man, that's so good to hear. And, he, and you just looked, he just, his shoulders just, oh, you know what I mean? Yeah, when wait. he heard that. And so would you mind sharing that? Because I think that that would, it just, it's so beneficial, I think, for myself included to to hear players that, you know, even at the highest level, like the, the human factor and the human element are are still at play. Yeah, no, no doubt. So there's, there's a country artist. Zach Bryan, who I'm a big fan of, and he's he, on his latest um, album. He's got a, a poem, a poem where he talks it, but it's the music. But the name of the poem is called Fear of Fri Fear and Fridays. And there's a line in that poem where he says, I rode the fear, even though I was afraid every single time. And that I know that to me talks to every player I've ever played with. And it surely talks to me from me. There wasn't a, a game where I wasn't nervous, anxious, insecure. Um, do I still have it? You know, that there was there was never a moment, and, and that's okay. That's okay to think that. That's okay to have those doubts and to have those insecurities, but you've got to let them go. You gotta, you gotta process it, understand it, and compete anyway. And that's where I kind of felt like I was now putting on my Superman suit was when I knew I had those fears, but you know what? I was still going to go out there and compete. I was still going to go out there and, and dominate. I was still going to go out there and, 
and fight. I wasn't going to let this fear make me crawl into my turtle shell and let you just beat me because I was scared of you. I was going to be scared of you and beat you in spite of that fear. And I learned that in 2005, the story you're talking about was the first time I really had a chance to play every day, no strings attached. Like you're the third baseman, run with it. And I let the fear of losing the job really affect me. And I ended up losing the job. <laughs> um, uh, I started off, I started off slow, started off making a few errors. I think I had three or four errors in the first week at third base. Um, I think I was hitting low two hundreds going into the May and yeah, I just, I did not want to go to the park. It was not fun going to the field. It was just going to be groundhog day. I was going to feel the tightness in my chest. I was going to be afraid that I was going to lose my job. I was afraid I was going to go over four. I was going to afraid that the ball was going to be hit to me. I was going to make an error. And all of those things happened because I was afraid of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I was putting so much pressure on myself to, to succeed and so much pressure on myself to, to, to have good numbers and have good results. Well, I couldn't control any of that. The only thing I could control was the mind frame and the mindset that I was in going into the park. So that off season, 2005, 2006, I made a conscious effort just to now be the best teammate I was going to be because I could control that. I could control my attitude when I got to the field. I would say hi to every usher I walked into the, when I walked into the Metrodome, I, everybody I came in contact with, I would smile and I would say hi and I would move on to the next person and do the same thing. I would invest in my teammates and what that ended up doing was it take it, it alleviated the pressure I was putting on myself because a lot of the times we feel like that pressure is there because we can't control it. We can't control those results. So yeah, we are anxious, but I can control it whether I'm going to be nice to you today or be a good teammate. I can control that and I can prepare for that. And it alleviated the pressure I was putting on myself. I went into April of 2006 and I didn't have hardly any at bats, but I still had that good attitude, that good mindset. Two guys got hurt. I was a starting right fielder batting fourth, hit 25, 20, 24 homers, drove in a hundred, scored a hundred in five months. And it wow. was literally because I took out, took out that pressure and that extra, that extra feeling of, of being out of control. So by, by thinking about yourself less, you, you yes. became a better teammate, all these other things. But the irony is, is you actually played better. Had way more success, way more success. I, I, um, I heard Josh Donaldson actually say the exact same thing when he was kind of up and down at the beginning of his career. He kind of said at one point he said, uh, he's like, man, I'm just going to try to do one thing just to help the team win today. Like I, I, I mm -hmm. that's it. Like, I'm not going to worry about going four for four or any of that. I'm just, maybe it could be just picking a guy up, patting him on the back, whatever, but that's the only thing I'm going to do. And he said the exact same thing that you said, just kind of, man, like the stress and pressure was just off of him, and he could just kind of just mm. be free. And um, it sounds like you went through that exact same thing too. No doubt. And that's why I'm such a huge proponent. It wasn't, it wasn't as big of a deal when I, when I was playing, I never really even heard about them, but quality at bats. Mm -hmm. I love quality of bats because now you've got so many different ways to be produ pro pro uh, to produce so many ways to produce without having to get a hit. And I used to in, and make those things up. I, I used to try and get one of four things, a hit, a walk, a run scored or a stolen base in that game. And if I did one of those four, I felt like I had a good game. If I had four more, like the quality at bats, getting a runner over, I mean, all those other things, man, I, I would have felt like I was the greatest baseball player on the planet. <laughs> how do you how do you go about helping some of these high school kids with uh, with the mental side of the game? Well, I think a lot of it is you got to be vulnerable. Um, first and foremost, I've got to be able to tell them my experiences in order for them to trust me. If I'm just telling them, yeah, be a good teammate. Yeah, do this. I mean, they're not going to trust me. They're just going to be just that's other some other old dude talking about how I got to be a good teammate. And he doesn't know. But if I'm vulnerable, if I'm telling them these experiences, like I just said to you, now there's that trust. Now there's like, oh, man, 
Yeah, you went through this too. You know what you're talking. You know what that feels like. Um, so conversations is the biggest thing. Um, and I think giving them autonomy to, to, to be able to make choices and make fail, not, I don't want to say fail, like not have the result that you want as a coach. Um, which I mean, I guess is, is fail. I just hate the word failing. Cause it's not, I mean, I, I just don't think we should talk like that, but it, if a kid has a an at bat that you didn't want that result to, it, it don't come down on them, you know, because that's just gonna continue to beat into that 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 tightness. That pressure is just gonna continue to mount, and nobody's gonna have success because of it. You're not gonna have success as a coach, and they're not gonna have success as a player. Do you think it would be beneficial for for? coaches to because because here's the thing it's kind of it, i view this a little bit similar to to eating and like meal prep right you meal mm -hmm. prep so you don't have to like when you're tired at the end of the day like you don't have to think like if you've already planned out you just pick it up go versus if you wait till then then you're just gonna go get the fast food and so mm -hmm. same thing with with um you know the mental side during the season it's like if you wait till the season you start struggling and then it's like you start struggling and then you try to figure out a plan a lot of times man it, it, it can be a bumpy road versus and i'm curious to hear what you what you think about this versus before the season starts you kind of plan for that right it's like here's my strategy for when i when when it, you know i start to uh you know struggle a little bit or scuffle but maybe not even scuffle but just not get the 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 outcomes that everybody else wants and i start to feel mm -hmm. down i've already got this plan and so now i can just go about it and and just kind of just keep myself accountable versus trying to figure it out when it happens sure yeah every i mean obviously being proactive in anything is is definitely in my opinion the the best route um sometimes you're not going to get in those situations where you can be proactive so yeah, in your training, um, you know, allow them, put them in situations that they just can't win in, period. Like, you know, compete all the time. I think the more you compete, the better you're going to be. You know, I like watching, I love watching the game of Survivor, right, on the TV show Survivor, because the the competitions at the end of the show for for to win immunity, it's not necessarily always the most, the strongest, um, like the most brawn person on the show doesn't necessarily win it. It wins it sometimes. Sometimes it's a, it's a, it's a challenge that's built to the strongest. Sometimes it's the smartest. Sometimes it's the most resilient. Sometimes it's the person that can endure the most. So when you're doing things in the off season, come up with different ways to allow different players to show what they're best at but then they're also those bet those guys that are always winning the the bench press challenge or always winning the sprint challenge those guys need to fail so you need to come up with a challenge and, and a conscious effort to allow the teammates that are smarter but smaller win mm. and that that person knows what it's like to not be the best on the team at something and i, I think the more you do that the more that they understand that they're going to be reliant on their teammates and they can't win everything and will allow them to deal with it when they go over for four with three strikeouts. It's a great point. Yeah. The, the competition thing. I think that's something that's lacking um, these days a lot with just how everything is, is set up in the travel baseball world and just, just the way it is. But speaking of travel baseball, I, I know, you know, you have a son, I know, you know, obviously as a parent, you want, your, you put your son in the, in the best position possible, like anybody out mm -hmm. there. And so I say that because obviously like what you emphasize and, and teach to him is kind of like, man, like this is, I, I want to set him up for success. Right. So what are some sure. stuff that, that you emphasize to him? Like, and this, and again, do you talk about mechanics with him? Do you talk, you know what I mean? Like all this stuff that you see online, mm -hmm. how much of that do you actually, like, do you think, is actually valuable versus not because I could say it, it could be one thing, but coming from you, it'd be like, there's, there's some serious, you know, willpower here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, don't, don't get it twisted. When I talk, sometimes I talk about mechanics to my son, he rolls his eyes, like you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, 
No, I look, we all need to know how to swing a bat, right? We all need to know how to swing a bat. There's, there's no mistaking about it that mechanics are important. And there's no question that mechanics are important. But again, anybody that is willing to invest time to study a swing can teach anybody how to swing. If you study enough, enough big leaguers or enough, I mean, I can go and, and watch, I can go and watch a swimmer. I can go watch Michael Phelps and break down Michael Phelps is, is stroke the way he swims in the pool from all the angles that I want. And I can teach you what it's supposed to look like, but I've never swam. I can't teach you how to swim in the Olympics. You know what I mean? And I'm not saying you need to be a big leaguer to, to be a coach or to be valuable, but you do need to go. The game of baseball is not played in a 12 by 40 cage or 12 by 50 cage. So at some point it needs to branch beyond what it looks like off of a pitching machine or what it looks like off of flips or what it looks like off of throwing. And in my opinion, and what I do with my son is oftentimes he will go and hit with a buddy and no coach around. Not even you. I don't go there. Not I now that he he's 15, I would say 70% of the time I'm not around. Mm. Because he needs to figure out everything on his own. Now I'll come in around and 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 I'll throw him BP once a week and and we'll talk and and do some things, but if he can't figure it out, then what am I going to do? I can't do anything for him in the box. I can't hit for him. Trust me. I wish I could. There's a lot of these 80 mile an hour throws that I would be banging, <laughs> <laughs> but I can't. So eventually you've got to let the player, you've got to teach the player. Sorry. You've got to teach the player how to coach themselves. And if you're doing it right and they come in for you and, and, and you're, they come in for their hour lesson, if you're doing it right, you shouldn't have to say you're just the BP thrower for an hour. Mm. If you're doing it the right way, in my opinion, if you're doing it the right way, because they should be able to take a swing or a, a, a series of swings, not a swing. I, I don't want to get that twisted either. Just because you take a bad swing doesn't mean you're it's bad take a series of bad swings or a series of bad results. They should be able, if you've done it right and depending on the level, I'm not saying a seven-year-old should be able to do this, but they should now be able to collect their thoughts, collect their feels and be able to make the adjustment in a cage setting. Did you help guide your son to that point? And like, how long did yes. that take to get to that point? Yeah. And it, it takes a while. Um, what I, what I like to do the best, the method that I've, I've kind of adopted. And I, when I, if, if uh, like I got some college guys that come in and, and if they, if they have something they want to work on, we work on it. If they just come in, I had a buddy ask me the other day, you got some college guys come in. Are you helping them work? And I'm like, no, like, what do you mean? I'm like, they don't need any work. They don't need any help. Like they got a really good swing. I'm looking at them in a 50 foot cage. It looks great. <laughs> so <laughs> I just throw them BP. I don't need to say anything. Um, it's, but the ones that do say, say they come in and be like, man, I, I need, I need to work on my path. I don't feel like my path is, is right. Fall this year, I was getting beat and I was popping it, whatever the case may be. We'll get it to where we'll take, I'll, I'll, we'll work on some things. And if they have a really good swing and they say, I, that one felt right. I'll have them take about 30 seconds and just feel the points in their body. What it felt like, close their eyes. They feel, feel what it felt like in their right butt cheek, feel what it felt like in your hamstring, feel what it felt like in your back rib cage. And then once they feel like they've got a grip on that, they get back in the cage and try and replicate the feel, not the swing, not the result. They try and replicate what that felt like. Mm. If they're able to do it again, same thing. We step out. They go through what it felt right. 
If they take a bad swing, I immediately get them to recall those good feelings again. I don't let them marinate on, man, I felt like I flew out or I felt like I collapsed or I felt like I pushed. They're not allowed to marinate on that. It's literally, let's recall what that good feeling felt like. And the goal is not to have a series of bad swings or bad feels. And once, once they've kind of gotten that understanding, they're able to do it on their own. Well, then what am I, I'm no use. I just throw BP. Hmm. Would your advice be to coaches at the high school level to have a, a similar approach? Yeah. And again, it, it's tough at the high school level in a, in a, in a, in a season, because you don't have time. I don't have time. You don't have time. If you've got 16 hitters on your high school team, you can't take 10 minutes on one guy while the other 15 right. kids are just kind of twiddling their thumbs. You know what I mean? It's if you, if you have one kid that you feel like you need to work with and you're willing to spend 30 minutes before or after practice and they are too, then yeah, a hundred percent. I think that's a tremendous approach, but I also understand that that sometimes isn't readily available. Last question for you. Who, um, who do you like? Like who's, who are some people that, you think I don't want to say do hitting the right way, but like like emphasize the the points that that you agree with, and doesn't have to be like necessarily even online, but maybe like a coach you know that you've had throughout your career, or just like who do you think like sh or should be some people that coaches who are listening to this should listen to more? I mean, that's a great a great question. Um, I'm probably going to answer it a little from a little different angle. Okay. I think the first thing that you need to do as a coach or you should do as a coach, I'm not going to say you need, you don't need to do anything um, that you should do as a coach is understand your belief system, understand what you want your players to accomplish because what that allows you to do is build or build a filter system within yourself and your brain and your mind. Mm. There's a lot of information out there and I watch a lot of things online. I've seen a lot of coaches. I've had a lot of coaches. I'm able to see the coaches on a professional level. I'm able to see coaches on a college level. I'm able to see coaches at a youth level and I'm able to pull valuable things from every single one of them, but I'm also able to see something and allow it to filter out and be like, nah, this ain't, this ain't it. But I'm also not holding judgment on that person either. Cause it might be it for whoever it is they're teaching. Mm. It might be it for that student. We don't know context of a lot of things, especially online. I mean, we see a drill online. It might've been the only three times that person have ever done that particular drill in their entire lives and they never did it again, but we're going to hold that as like, that's the drill that this person that created that made this person who it is. I tell this story quite a bit. When I was in Colorado, I had, um, I had something, I had a, like a tightness in my lat, my back, my right lat was sore, tight. I could never loosen it up. So when I was on the on deck circle, like the only way I felt like I could, I was ready to get in the box was I would kind of like, stretch it out and then from there i would just like swing straight down had nothing to do with what i was about to do in the in the box had nothing to do with my swing it was literally because that's how i felt like i was going to be able to stretch out my lat before i got in the box and i probably did it for about three weeks before i it felt better and i go to like this seminar coaches clinic or something like that a few weeks later in colorado and this coach says man i just want to thank you and i'm like thank me for what he goes we, we started doing that kadire drill and i'm like what are you talking about kadire drill it's like yeah we, we get up there and we stretch out really high and we have our guys just swing straight down before they go into the box <laughs> so context is everything and there's a lot of times when you don't get to see the context of what's being taught but yet we want to go out there and try and replicate it and that's why I say it's really important to build that filter system within your own mind of what it is that you actually want to accomplish with your hitters. First of all, that story is amazing. I'm going to, I'm going to share that with a ton of people too, but to follow up on the belief system. So is that, are those, is the system something that you like 
you believe in wholeheartedly. Like it's it's something you're not willing to to um begrudge on. Like you're not you're not changing mm-hmm. your thoughts or feelings on that. Is that yeah. what you mean? Yeah, I yeah, I'm, I'm yes. But I'm also what's that? There's a quote, have have strong beliefs held loosely or something like mm-hmm. that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, have your belief system that you you're going to fight, but you're also going to be open minded enough where you can change your mind and you're allowed to change your mind and it's okay to change your mind. It's okay to contradict what it is that you just say. It's okay to get new information and be like, you know what? I was wrong. Like, that's okay. That's fine. But yes, you have to also have these beliefs. Like for instance, I'm, I wholeheartedly firmly believe that the engine of your swing is your, if you're left-handed, it's your back left hip. And if you're right-handed, it's your back right hip. And you've got to coil into that. And that's where that generates. And that's where it starts. And that's where I start with hitters. But at the same time, if somebody's able to tell me something else and, and show me something different, that, God, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. I've got to be also willing to understand that and move move into a different direction. Or if it's not clicking with this particular hitter, i got to figure out a way now to get it to where they're generating it from where I think they should be, but they're not getting it with the way that I'm explaining it. So I got to figure out another way to articulate it. And that's where you start being able to pull information from other people and throw it through your filter. Man, that makes a lot of sense. Does it go with what I believe? Yes. Okay. Now I'm going to introduce that to my, to this player. Mm -hmm. But if, if I see that and it doesn't really go with what I believe, well, now I'm able to filter that out. I'm not going to bring it to my player. I'm going to look for something else, another way to, to get to him. Gotcha. Him or her. It, it makes a, uh, I don't know if you ever heard of this guy named Paul Graham, but he started this company or it's called Y Combinator. It helps more, the most amount of, it's helped start up the most startups of all time. And, you know, and so anyway, one of the things he was saying one time is, you know, you don't read books to acquire information or knowledge. And I was like, Okay. And then he was said, he said, you read books for, to start a bonfire in your, in your brain of new ideas. And that's why you Mm. read books. And so Mm -hmm. it kind of, you saying that right there made me think about it too. It's like, yes, someone maybe have a different opinion, but maybe they say something or do something and it sparks an idea for, for you in your own coaching career. So, um, absolutely. Well, first, I I buy, I buy all the gimmicks. Like I buy them all. I mean, I, I do, I buy, I buy, it could look like the, this thing doesn't, there's no way in the world this thing works. I buy it. I swing it. I do it. I use it. And then I either introduce it to players or I throw it away. And that, and that's the thing. It might spark. God, this really does give me this feeling, Mm -hmm. even though it looks ridiculous. It does give me this feeling. It does bring value. So Mm -hmm. the things like that. Well, I appreciate you coming on today, man. I mean, this is, you know, I had Clint Hurdle on several weeks ago, and um, I just think guys like like yourself, like Clint, who been in the game for a, a long time and played at the the highest level, and I just think there's there's certain things that you can only learn and really know when you play if you play the game or around the game at the highest level for for a long time. And so appreciate you doing stuff like this. I know you do other stuff too, but I just think, uh, I mean, it's just, it's really impactful and insightful. And, uh, you know, it just, it honestly is going to change, I think a lot of coaches and how they view hitting and, and, and teaching. And so it just, it's really impactful. So I just wanted to say, I appreciate you coming on and doing it because, um, I know you don't have to, but, uh, man, it's going to, it's going to bring a a ton of value and, and definitely help a ton of players. No, I appreciate you, Patrick. Like I said, when, when you reached out to me, I, I appreciate the, the different angles that you attack the game of baseball because it's, it's, a, it's a very simple game, very hard to play, and it's very messy, and there's no absolutes. So if you have anybody that says this is the way it should be done, <laughs> probably going to steer clear. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>